Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Ola and Farm Investor Conference webinar about financial results and companies' activities in the second quarter of 2018. Today, our host is Mr. Salus Lapinch, advisor to the board of Ola and Farm. Before I give the floor to Salvis, a short reminder about the agenda of the webinar. As always, we will start with the company's presentation, after which Salvis will answer all your questions. If you would like to use the opportunity to ask your question to Mr. Lapinch, please use the question box on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed after the presentation. However, you are welcome to send in your questions also during the presentation. Salvi, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's um, really nice uh, to talk to you after uh, some break. Uh, and um, yeah, let us uh, gradually start uh, our, uh, our presentation uh, this afternoon. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think I should um, should be starting with some sort of reintroduction. I'm Salvas Lapinch, and uh, I guess most of you know me from the previous webinars and other investor contacts uh, that uh, we've been having. Um, what happened to me in this during this time that uh, after after one of my my interviews regarding the development of a company, uh, I expressed my concerns about how minority shareholders might be treated, uh, and soon after the previous uh, council. Uh, I had no sort of confidence vote in me, uh, and I was dismissed from uh, my board uh, position. And since after that, I had virtually no influence to the de development of a company. I felt like I could not really uh, perform my duties in a decent quality, and uh, hence resigned from uh, all the positions in company in early August this year. Uh, and during this period, for those of you who follow, uh, except uh, some limited monthly sales uh, publications, no other investor contacts uh, really have been um, done uh, by uh, oil and farm. Now, what has changed since is, you know, that uh, unexpectedly in September 4th, the company's uh, council was changed. Uh, and very soon after that, I was approached by new council members, uh, and, and they claimed that one of their top priorities is to renew and to strengthen the transp transparency in invest investor relations standards that uh, throughout these years Oil and Farm has been uh, famous for. Um, so we had a number of meetings and it took about three weeks for um, for us to agree that uh, we'll uh, join the current Oil and Farm team in advisory capacity, try to restart and improve on uh, investor relation practices that, that were somewhat uh, somewhat abandoned uh, during this period. So this this is a little bit of, of background of, of what's happening. Uh, why are you hearing me in this, this webinar uh, this evening? So let's uh, let's get to the business. Let's look at the uh, second quarter results. Um, you see in the charts that it's uh, although its uh, sales volume has has somewhat dropped compared to the uh, second quarter of last year, uh, it's still one of the best quarters in corporate history in terms of sales. Uh, in total, we made a sales of 31 million euros. Um, the sales drop compared to, to Q2 of last year is about is by about 9%, mainly due to the fact that in the uh, first half of last year, and specifically in the second quarter of last year, our shipments of paramino salicylic acid to the World Health Organization were extremely well, uh, went extremely well, and, and we didn't have them this year. Uh, so uh, that's about 3 million uh, three million difference, uh, and uh, that's pretty much what's behind this sales drop in, in uh, by nine percent. Um, everything else is 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 going quite smoothly. You see, the pharmacies have sold uh, in this quarter alone uh, products worth 5.8 million uh, euros. Uh, Silvanos is having a very good year so far, uh, even in the second quarter, which in their business is far from uh, from a good one. They made the sales of 1.3 million euros. And uh, Tono Sellers, together with Elast Medical, which is their Russian distribution arm, is are also doing quite nicely, and they made sales of 2.4 uh, million euros in uh, second quarter alone. In terms of profit, things look even a little better. Uh, we have a profit growth by 32% uh, in uh, this second quarter compared to the second quarter of last year. Um, still, we have some impact of forex losses, uh, and the main reason why, why we are doing better in this quarter than a year ago 
is that these forex losses are somewhat smaller. Uh, still, the, the impact of chemical products and uh, a lower added value income like pharmaceutical resale is increasing uh, in, uh, as, a, as a share in, in, in our group. Uh, that, of course, is, is um, influencing the gross margins. Um, however, net, net margin is higher as uh, uh, ruble loss, like I said before. Uh, we, we still had a uh, devaluating ruble during this quarter. But it was it has been devaluating a little less than it was devaluating uh, one year ago. Now, um, EBITDA was also adversely impacted by a number of things, uh, including the sales mix, but also uh, uh, also uh, well, uh, Russian ruble behavior, uh, especially that um, that little hike you saw in uh, early early days of April, uh, among other things, also influenced. Uh, the value of, uh, of our top line uh, of sales figures. So uh, it's been very early in the quarter. You have a serious devaluation in, of Russian ruble in short period of time. That also, uh, of course, left an, an influence on, on, on things like uh, nominal uh, EBITDA. If you look at the products in the second quarter, you see Mayor Medin is, is leader again. Uh, basically, all top 10 has been uh, stable. No changes there. Um, besides Merlin, it's Adaptol, Furagin, and Meldonium gain the shares, uh, while Nofen and Solo Furaginium products uh, and Memantine lost a little bit. Um, but also, um, you know, has to do with seasonality because in Q2, I normally would see Remontadin among, uh, among top 10 products, but of course, that's not the case in Q2 uh, due, to, due to seasonality. Now, uh, if you look at the countries in Q2, you see that unlike in Q1, Russia is again the, the uh, biggest sales market of ours. Uh, from uh, the other markets, uh, they basically all shrunk, but they most of them didn't shrink in nominal terms, just their share shrunk, uh, pretty much because uh, Ukraine has grown, uh, Ukraine's share has grown from 8% in Q1 to 12% in Q2. In general, we've seen later slides that this has been a very good performance for Ukraine so far in the year. Um, yeah, uh, Japan and India that we used to have in Q1, uh, we had in Q1 uh, in, in top 10 markets, is now replaced by, by Poland and Tajikistan. These are uh, two and other developments as far as our key uh, key countries are concerned. So a little bit about six months. In terms of six months, we are um, seeing some reduction in sales by about 1%. And again, uh, pretty much like in Q2 figures, uh, it's paramium silicic acid, the absence of it, to be precise, that, that plays a role here. So even with losing slightly more than 3 million in sales to them, we have managed to pretty much remain uh, the same uh, sales level. Again, pharmacy, uh, pharmacies and silonors are doing quite a good job. Uh, pharmacies, we expect to have sales of close to 25 million this year, so pretty much in pretty much um, on track. Um, Silvanols, we expect uh, their sales this year to be above 6 million, so they're also doing quite nicely. And uh, uh, Tonus Celast and Elast Medical, uh, despite some, some disruptions, despite the, uh, in currency terms, quite well the market they're working, uh, they're also uh, performing uh, reasonably well uh, so far this year. Profit, uh, we have a little increase. We, According to preliminary data, we are at 5.8 million euros, which is a slight increase compared to last year. Um, like I said before, we are having some impact of forest losses and net provisions in uh, six months, uh, net changes to provisions was the increase of, of uh, half a million euros, uh, mainly for some uh, Russian receivables. And also Latvian tax legislation. The absence of corporate income tax, as it was a year ago, has also contributed a little bit uh, to this improvement. Now, if you look at the countries, uh, of course, um, you see uh, in Russia, we've uh, lost about 1 million in sales. Uh, even more we lost in others, and in those others, of course, mainly we have Netherlands. And those of you who are uh, regular um, uh, listeners to webinar know that uh, it's it's again the anti-tuberculosis product that we ship to Netherlands uh, that that shows in these charts in Netherlands. So that's absent 
uh, these six months. So this is where the major drop comes from. As far as most of the other markets are concerned, we see uh, very good performance in Latvia. We see very good performance in Belarus. We see very good performance in six months in Ukraine. Uh, so um, especially in the second quarter. Um, so uh, yeah, these 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 are the the countries that have. Uh, provided this relative stability. Yeah, the slide is still called uh, growth drivers, uh, but unfortunately there was uh, no growth, but still uh, still some uh, you know, contribution um, to, the, to the sales uh, are, are coming, uh, some important contribution to the sales are coming from these from sales to those countries. Of course, in, in percentage terms, uh, we see the Japan uh, being uh, Increasing by 324 percent. Unfortunately, the base is small. That uh, overall, it it doesn't add that much uh, to uh, in monetary terms uh, to the end result. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, quite shortly about how we were performing in Q2 in six months. And now the quite traditional poll question uh, is uh, how do you how do you uh, see uh, these six month results for the fund? I think we've been performing uh, worse than expected. We were performing just as you expected, or maybe even better than you expected. I'll give you a few moments um, to vote, and uh, I'm uh, as before you before you do that. I, uh, I really want to say thanks for uh, showing that big interest in this webinar. We have 30 attendees uh, right now, uh, so um, haven't been that many for a while. Uh, but again, due to recent developments, I think it's. Um, it's quite understandable, the interest. Um, I presume that uh, many of you uh, joined this webinar not only because of our financial uh, figures, but also about all the other developments and information that's coming uh, from the oil farm or around the oil farm. Uh, and of course, we will focus uh, focus on those uh, shortly. I think um, it was enough time uh, for uh, polling. Uh, for you to decide what's your attitude towards our Q2 and, and six month results. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, since many things have been happening around our company, I, I uh, could not uh, skip that. And of course, uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on, on, on more uh, recent developments and, and, and uh, intentions of a new team during the next uh, couple of slides. So as you know, we had an extra uh, ordinary general meeting on September the 4th, uh, which was initially convened uh, to make amendments to articles, but quite unexpectedly to many, 60% uh, of the council and two thirds of the auditing committee were replaced. Um, although the process of replacing uh, the council did not meet the, the uh, best corporate governance criteria, to, to put it lightly, uh, newly uh, elected council quite soon in the process declared the intention to improve the governance and transparency standards. And uh, I'm honored that vice chairperson of the council and the daughter of uh, late Valerie Maligans, uh, Irina Maligan, is with me here today to add a couple of words to this slide. Irina? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Irina Maligina and I'm a member of the Council, CEO of Sia Alma Farm, um, a company that holds a little bit over 40% shares in uh, online farm. And last but not least, uh, I am a proud daughter of late Valeria Maligin and I'm very honored of having an opportunity to speak to such a big audience this afternoon. I am the person who is behind the unexpected change of company's council in early September. I do realize that the way it was done was not necessary, necessarily the most transparent one, um, to say the least. However, um, I was very carefully following the developments, priorities, intentions, and attitudes that were dominating um, in the previous council and the uh, people surrounding it. Um, it increasingly seemed that many of them are very far from what my father intended for, for, for the company, for online farm, and what is in the best interests of the company. Thank you, and I give a word back to Salvas. Uh, thank you, Irina. That's a little bit of more insider information for you. 
Um, so uh, yeah, let's um, let's now um, move into the greater details of, of uh, what really happened. So the uh, new supervisory council was elected for a period of five years, and the members were, uh, were uh, Pavel Svebenox, he is now a chairman of the council. Irina Maligina, whom you just heard, is a vice chairwoman of the council. Uh, Martin Shkrietis and Diana Sirlaka, as well as Signe Baldur Sildes, they were elected uh, council members. But a few weeks after the election, Ms. Signe Baldur Sildes has, has decided to resign uh, from um, uh, that position. Total remuneration of all the council members together has been increased from 40,000 to 70,000 euros per month. That's per five uh, council members. So the new chairman, Mr. Paolo Srebenox, um, was elected new chairman. His previous positions include several uh, law offices, uh, boards of several companies, including Freeports of Ventspils uh, and uh, uh, Jitsu Company, Vigas Juris Linea. Mr. Rebenox has also been head of the legal department of PricewaterhouseCoopers and advisors Latvian Minister of uh, Finance and Prime Minister of Latvia in early uh, 2000s. Um, auditing committee has already be, also been changed. Uh, elect for, elected now for a two-year period. Uh, Mr. Vestos Gurtlovs, uh, the long-term uh, member of the auditing committee, is still chairing it. But the new members of the auditing committee include Diana Sirlaka and Irina Maligina, both members of the supervisory council. Also, the remuneration of the auditing committee has been slightly changed. It was increased from 11,500 euros uh, per month to 12,000 euros per month. Now, uh, the current council has been around for, uh, it's not even a full month yet, but um, there have been uh, uh, several activities that uh, they have already been engaged in and I just uh, uh, pointed a uh, pointed, uh, few out of them um, that uh, I, I thought were worth mentioning in, in this audience. Um, so, uh, as you may notice, routine investor relation activities have, have been almost fully restored. Uh, we had uh, more decent uh, monthly sales figures and uh, I personally will be doing my best to make sure that they are uh, in future submitted in a more timely manner with uh, more uh, comprehensive information. Uh, the company has also uh, uh, contracted a very experienced corporate governance expert to assess the existing governance practices and suggest improvements. Uh, including suggestions on long-term dividend policy. Uh, within the next month, uh, the practice of uh, having a sort of autumn, every autumn we had these Baltic Nordic roadshows, will be restarted. We are currently in negotiations and uh, preparing the schedules. So most likely in the first weeks of November, we'll be uh, traveling uh, uh, throughout Baltics and Nordics. And so if, if, if you might be interested in meeting us, uh, wherever you are, uh, please contact either me or, or, or uh, somebody in OFM uh, to um, express your interest. Um, negotiations with one uh, Western European-based producer of elastic materials has been started. Those negotiations started uh, roughly one year ago, and that's something that Mr. Rebenox has been referring to in media that, that we have made uh, public in uh, stock exchange announcements. Um, the uh, expected cost of transaction uh, is, is below 2 million euros uh, and uh, if concluded, uh, such transaction would uh, basically be a ticket for uh, our daughter company Tonus Elast uh, to start their sales in, in Germany and other Western uh, European countries. Um, yeah, the, the negotiations are ongoing. Um, uh, of course, we haven't haven't signed uh, any contracts yet, uh, but uh, the, the research that we have, have conducted shows that uh, should such a contract be signed, it, it might seriously boost presence of of Tonus Elast in in, in Western uh, several Western companies, Western countries, and hence uh, hopefully improve their financials and their, therefore the group financials significantly. As far as funding of that uh, eventual acquisition is concerned, uh, like I said, uh, the, the contract hasn't been signed yet and the payments uh, procedure uh, has therefore also not been agreed, but we believe that uh, you know, either uh, separate uh, companies of the group or the group together 
uh, is certainly capable of uh, e either raising uh, funding for a deal like that or, or probably funding that from own cash flows depending on what the payment procedures are. So uh, in, my, in my understanding, uh, deal of that volume does not represent any major challenge in terms of um, having a funding for it. Um, also, uh, veterinary medicine has been identified as a possible uh, source of growth and uh, the company has already started um, some, some research in this area. So these are just a few things that, that the current council has done over the last, uh, well, even less, less than a month so far. So, um, yeah, um, it's only two poll questions this time. And the second one is uh, very straightforward. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen, the, of course, certain price drop <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the share price. Uh, but uh, the financials of the company are, are still there. Uh, performance is still there. Uh, and uh, the question really is, um, what's your most likely, most likely behavior uh, given the current share price, given the financial performance, given the intentions of the team? Are you more likely to buy shares? Are you more likely to hold shares? Or are you more likely to sell shares? Uh, that's a very simple and uh, simplistic way of forecasting share price movements of course uh, but um, but please take your time to vote um, yeah one more thing that that I know was done already by by the new team at line farm is that we now have a third liquidity provider a Lithuanian company called Orion um, so we are one of the very few Baltic companies that now have uh, three liquidity providers uh, of course um, you know this this doesn't uh, Create uh, liquidity like you, you know, like you see for similar companies and other stock exchanges, but um, you know it certainly uh, helps the retail investors to you know, either buy or sell their shares with less impact to the to the share price, and in general, of course, shows uh, shows different attitude to uh, to uh, all levels of shareholders, even the very small ones. So um, yeah, I think. Um, I think we had uh, time enough for you to decide what you want to do with your shares. Yeah, and um, and uh, yeah, that's that's about it uh, from the sort of uh, official part of a, of a webinar. So I'm uh, ready for a very tough Q and A session. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. As you said, let's proceed with the questions. A reminder to those who haven't yet submitted their questions, you can do it in the question section in the settings panel zone on your right side. To start with, investors are interested in the future dividend policy of Wolline Farm. So, Ali, could you please comment on that? Yeah, like, like I said before, uh, the company has uh, contracted uh, uh, corporate governance, uh, well-known corporate governance experts uh, that, that will be looking at many things, including the dividend policy. Uh, from my own attitudes and experiences, uh, what I can say is that except for last year, when we had the exceptionally large dividend payment of something like 9 million in total, uh, several previous years in a row, Oland Farm has been paying the total dividend of uh, between three, around 3 million euros per annum, which is roughly 25 to 30 percent payout ratio, and has been doing fine with that. So um, I don't know what the, the, the end dividend policy is going to be like, but uh, clearly the intention is to A, uh, be paying dividends every single year, unless it's uh, you know some disaster, 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 which we don't foresee uh, any, anytime soon. Uh, soon. Uh, B, um, yeah, um, I do fully share the, the, the concern of shareholders that, you know, uh, it, it would be nice to have it on some sort of paper and have it on so, as some sort of obligation. So, yeah, the A will be dividend. Uh, level of three to four million per annum is totally sustainable by the company. How about its future development? That, that remains to be suggested by the, the analysts and, and approved by uh, the management and then uh, eventually shareholders and uh, as, as, as long as I'm uh, advising the company in investor relations matters, um, uh, I promise I'll, when I have more clear ideas about how should it look like, I'll, I'll bring this out for discussion uh, amongst you. Eva? Thank you. Could you please comment on the stock price drop from the year 2017, meaning minus 40% in price? 
Yeah, if you compare it to the highest price level, which I believe was summer August 2017 and was 1150, uh, then of course there's uh, quite a dramatic drop. Um, number of reasons I would I would I would split this drop probably in, in three parts. The first part is, uh, and I remember that quite clearly that, uh, and you could see that in, in actually in this presentation, that uh, despite very good uh, sales results of the second quarter of last year, OMF Farm did not, for a number of reasons, uh, did not quite deliver on profitability, uh, which everybody was expecting that we would. Uh, hence, the high uh, share price right prior to publication of six-month results. Uh, and hence, a relatively rapid drop soon after that, once those expectations were not met. That would be first part of the drop, and I guess that was a drop between something like 11.5 to something like 10.5 or 10 euros a share. Um, the second uh, big drop really came after the after passing away of Mr. Maligans in December. Uh, at that time, I, th I think it, it dropped between something like 9.50 to something like 8 at some point. Uh, and the the third big drop came, and that was probably don't really have a, a calculator or chart in front of me. That's that's purely the way I remember it. A third big drop was was during the the period of certain uncertainty uh, after Mr. Maligans passed away, and uh, and uh, there was n no clarity about how and by whom the company is going to be run and. Uh, is it uh, capable of, of running without him on, and who will eventually be in charge uh, and uh, and uh, things like that and uh, yeah out of that between uh, June and September uh, shares share dropped uh, 16 percent now I'm uh, well delighted to see that for almost a month there is no well certainly almost four weeks uh, the share is relatively stable, the area of 665, 670. Uh, I hope that the efforts to you know, improve um, uh, investor relations by the current um, council will help stabilize it and, and, and maybe even return that to more decent levels. Because if you look at the multiples, uh, it has been a while since we've been trading that cheaply. Um, yeah, so. Um, I think the, the, the prerequisites are here for the share price to at least stabilize, stabilize, but but hopefully um, regain some of the some of the positions it uh, it had uh, during the last uh, year. So that's my comment, Eva. Thank you for the extensive information. Uh, then uh, the next question: Has the remuneration of the new supervisory board and audit committee increased or decreased compared to previous? Yeah, it, it, it has it has increased. Uh, it has increased specifically uh, uh, strongly if you compare it to the remuneration of the council that we had, uh, let's say, two councils away. Um, you can, of course, discuss proportionately to the performance of a company how justified it is or isn't. Um, but uh, one of the intentions of of, of the, the current team is to uh, have more and more professional people uh, attracted to the management of the company, including the council, eventually, and uh, of course that would that would require uh, well, certainly bigger remunerations that we had uh, compared to last year. I might be mistaken, but last year we we're probably talking about like 1,000 euros per, per per board member or something. Of course, you cannot really expect them to. to um, uh, top level uh, people joining your team for that money. I would really um, more more um, hope that uh, people do create uh, more value for the shareholders. Um, and uh, if if we look at in at that in in this perspective, uh, that uh, the council delivers uh, both in terms of company's performance and in terms of share performance. Uh, I would say the current level is adequate. If they do not manage to deliver, then of course it's a, that's a different story. Yeah. Thank you. In addition to the information provided uh, during the presentation, could you please update us on the status of export market growth? Do things go according to plan? Uh, in most in most uh, terms, they do. Um, 
as you remember from previous uh, webinars, uh, the sales drop in Russia was pretty much uh, planned uh, for a number of reasons, including um, uh, the expected uh, instability of, of, of ruble uh, and, uh, and, and some other issues. Um, what wasn't maybe as planned, it, it, it wasn't, uh, what wasn't planned was the, the virtual absence of uh, anti-tuberculosis product sales. Uh, but uh, all the other markets are doing quite well. Uh, I mean, you saw the, except for Russia, three other leading markets, namely uh, Belarus, Latvia and Ukraine are, are doing quite fine. And if you look at what our uh, declared sales targets are for this year and how we are performing so far, you see we are maybe just a little bit behind schedule, but very close to it. So, uh, you know, always there's not one pleasant surprise in one country and one negative surprise in another country, but uh, all in all, it's it's quite close to the plan. Eva? All right. Now looking into future, what's the provisional plan for the next year and for the next five years? Um, well, uh, the, the, the budgets for the next year are currently being prepared. And um, afterwards, we'll, we'll look at the more longer term perspective. But uh, strategically, uh, the plan is to try to return to the growth policies uh, established by, by uh, Valeris Maligins. Uh, and you remember that uh, those times we were growing both organically through new markets, inorganically through acquisitions um, that uh, you know, have, been, have been funding some marketing efforts heavily. and. Uh, and then those brought returns. Um, so um, similar strategies seem to be adopted by the new team. And uh, and uh, yeah, they they uh, cannot. I mean, we're talking about roughly one month, uh, and all those plans, of course, are not quantified yet. Um, but um, that's that's the general approach for uh, for next years to come. Yeah. Thank you. Is the supervisory board satisfied with the performance of the current management board? Is the current composition of the management board sustainable for the long term, and why? Um, the unfortunately, uh, Irina has left already. Uh, but from uh, their uh, announcement uh, to the stock exchange, which was made uh, shortly after uh, the election, uh, I think they quite clearly stated that uh, they do trust the, the the management board, and basically. Um, most of uh, most of uh, board members are, are the ones that have been delivering the growth of foreign farm in all aspects uh, pretty much since roughly 2010 2011 uh, so this is a team that has um, demonstrated itself and, uh, and uh, no surprise to me that the new council members are expecting uh, expressing their um, the confidence in them um, so um, yeah I, I mean, what, what has been made public of them um, shows and says that they do uh, do trust them. Yeah. Thank you. Have there been any indications or discussions that Oline Farm potentially could be bought over or merged with some bigger pharmacy company as a solution for the shareholders' disagreements? Well, well you, you, I mean, especially in... in um, in Latvia, there have been uh, in, in media have been a number of speculations about uh, all possible interests to acquire uh, oil and farm or parts of oil and farm or something. But uh, again, um, you know, it's it's um, it's it's of course the, the the shareholders that that eventually decide that. From what I know publicly, is that uh, in his last will and testament, Mr. Maligans put a five-year limit on uh, when the shares could be sold and. Uh, also, uh, I believe Irina Maligina in uh, one of her recent announcements said that uh, in no way is she intending or interested in, in selling or, or alienating uh, her shares in oil and farm in any way. So, um, yeah, there have been plenty of rumors, but uh, I think there has been no clear, um, undoubted indication that anything is of that is, is going to happen soon. Eva? Thank you. In a situation where stock price of the company is heavily down, 
due to corporate governance issues, why there was increasing compensation for supervisory board members and audit committee, how it is justified that in a situation where shareholders have lost circa 30% of their wealth since changes of the management, 10% of net profit is distributed out to various councils and committees. Salvi? Yeah, I quite agree to the statement, but uh, then again, uh, I, I say it's that uh, let, let's see, let's look at the deeds, um, and uh, uh, I would I would rather see that with current compensation, uh, the board, could, the council can gradually uh, attract uh, company can gradually attract uh, more and more uh, professional uh, board members, council members, to its management, and and uh, have uh, the company back on. Uh, on, on the track of growth, uh, of course, uh, from the from the uh, for, from the sort of um, first first appearance point of view, it, 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 it looks quite ugly. But uh, let's let's give uh, let's give them a try. Let's see how uh, how they succeed at at uh, restoring the growth and, and restoring the trust in the company. Uh, might as well be worth it. Yeah. Thank you. Proceeding about supervisory board, why nobody on supervisory board level has industry experience? Well, um, the question really is what, what, what do you see by industry experience? Um, supervisory, supervisory board should really, in my understanding at least, uh, be having uh, a uh, you know, governance experience. Uh, I don't think that the uh, in a pharmaceutical company, uh, the board member should be able to synthesize something or, or run a pharmacy. I mean, if they have that knowledge, that's fine. But I would guess that that primary focus should be on on being able to 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 run the company, being able to govern the company, attain results. I know, um, uh, do all the all the sort of tasks and intentions that that shareholders have put forward. Um, and the fact is that they not necessarily been pharmacists or or uh, chemists or something like that. Uh, I would not put that as a priority. It's, it, it, it's nice if you can have a, a good uh, governance people and good pharmacy people, but uh, um, normally you have either one or other. Being a great pharmacist or synthesis doesn't necessarily mean you are great in governance and vice versa. Yeah. Thank you, Sal. How Silvano sales in Russia have changed in 2018 after significant investment into marketing in 2017? Um, that's that's one of the uh, things that have not delivered. I have to say that uh, mainly because the food supplement uh, regulation change in Russia, uh, so they've been staying pretty flat. But but all those costs. So basically, uh, I put it that way, the, the, the serious launch of, of Silvanols, uh, the full-scale launch, uh, in, uh, has not been cancelled, it's been postponed. Uh, and the uh, most of the costs uh, that were made for that uh, are already done. Um, and big major costs really were related to having uh, pharmacy chains in, in Moscow and, and the region uh, accept Silvanols' products on their shelves. Um, now it's a little bit of regulatory um, issues that that we are working with. So uh, for that for that reason, not always not um, full spectrum of products was uh, was available to Russian market. Um, so yeah, in in, in in those sense, so far 2008 has not been as as we expected. Uh, but we would not really regard those investments as lost as 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 as, as they are made. The effect is there, and uh, as, as, as soon as uh, with Silvanos products we manage to stabilize um, their presence in Russian market, they, they should deliver. Um, that's, 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 that's our belief. Eva? Thank you. Have there been any personal changes in Online Farm sales team in 2018? Um, no, none from any leading positions that I would know of. Sales team is about the same. Um, of course, um, as, as a group of company, we have several hundreds of sales reps throughout uh, all the markets that we operate. And, uh, and if you have several hundreds of people, uh, uh, people, uh, you know, do change. Uh, 
there is a circulation of staff uh, inevitably, but from the uh, say key managerial personnel, I don't really know of anyone in sales team that that would have left. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you answered, you partially answered the next question, uh, but please add if you do something, if you do have something. So why company plans to buy a new production facility in Western Europe? How the acquisition will be financed? Yeah, um, like I said, um, and, I, and I can see that from the audience, audience uh, uh, questions, um, there, there is a certification uh, of uh, products like the ones that Tonus Elast produces uh, for several uh, Western European countries and uh, to be honest this is pretty much a uh, protectionist of course measure uh, and uh, Tonus Elast has been trying to enter those markets several ways uh, and, and get that certificate several, certificate several ways and um, uh, was not able um, so um, yeah, you can say it's trying to um, achieve the same result uh, going going sort of via back doors. Um, yeah, so that's that's a whole rationale uh, behind having a look at, at that company. Yeah. All right. Would you like to comment on the financing? Well, yeah. Like 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 I said, we were talking about deal uh, probably significantly below 2 million uh, euros and, uh, and the negotiations are still ongoing uh, and um, I, uh, I uh, think that either Tono Sellers or Warren Parmore, the group in any combination are quite capable of financing such a deal themselves uh, or if, if uh, you know, might, might even not be Necessary to attract any 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 uh, loan financing to that. So for uh, for group scale, we are really talking. Like some pharmacies are more expensive than this deal, so I don't really see any major stress as far as funding that transaction if it's worthwhile. Uh, so I don't see any any stress how how financing the transaction could occur. Thank you. Would this new acquisition add new activity lines or sectors to online farm? No, that's that's pretty much. Uh, Continuation expansion of uh, of, of what Tono Sellers does. Um, that let's put it this way: some some uh, more segmented activity lines might be added to Tono Sellers, uh, but uh, yeah, not not really to all firm, but but certainly to the group. Yeah. Could you please name a few key decisions which the council and or the management board is planning to make in nearest months in order to improve stock markets, investors' con confidence in the company? Yeah, I, I pretty much touched upon those already um, a little bit, but, but let me expand a little. So, um, yeah, the, the investor relations are, are made one of the priorities. Uh, like I said, we are having webinars uh, that, that we haven't had for a while. Uh, and uh, we are planning to do a roadshow um, very soon uh, that also was quite unclear whether or not uh, this would be done. Uh, they uh, have uh, hired a corporate governance uh, expert, uh, also uh, to the best of my knowledge a, a alumni of uh, Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance, one of the, uh, one of the people from there, uh, to help prepare them uh, well, first of all, assess uh, corporate governance standards and, and improve, suggest improvements. Um, also, we plan to visit the biggest uh, minority shareholders personally and we'll be talking to them and, and, and uh, uh, maybe not even wait for the November old show. Um, all of those activities, uh, plus again, uh, third, uh, third uh, liquidity provider, uh, all of those activities are targeted at uh, rebuilding trust in the banking and investor community. Well, the reason I'm here is also probably part of of, of, of that effort. That uh, you know, Oil and Farm was quite famous in the region for uh, for having good corporate um, um, good investor relations, and uh, the intention of the council uh, seems to be to you know. At least renew that in a previous level, and, and, and maybe even maybe even strengthen in some positions. So there are a number of decisions like that. Eva? Thank you, Salve. Good to hear. 
recently published draft of company's articles of association for the shareholders meeting state that management board consists of five management board members and each has the right to represent the company only jointly with two other members of the management board. Could you please elaborate what is the aim and idea behind these changes? Um, uh, as, as far as I know, these changes have been have been suggested by uh, the other two heirs, and since I have not prepared them, I cannot really comment. What it tells me that that that's a demonstration of quite a distrust uh, towards the management board, and I've been a member of management board, and I know that such situation might make everyday decisions of the boards unnecessarily difficult, uh, so I certainly do not share them. And, uh, and uh, I do not really know what rationale is behind uh, this suggestion. So it, it's, I think the people that come up with this uh, are, are the ones that should be asked. I cannot really comment this. Thank you. Please describe your strategy regarding the expansion of your pharmacy chain in Latvia and also in Belarus. Um, yeah, excuse me. Um, as, as far as expansion of pharmacy chain is concerned, um, as, 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 um, as far as uh, pharmacy chain, pharmacies in Latvia are concerned, uh, it's really difficult to come up with any sort of strategy because there are so few independent pharmacies left. And then you pretty much look at case by case basis. Uh, you know, um, don't have uh, exact numbers in front of me, but let's say there are a few hundred independent pharmacies left only. Out of those, um, less than half probably are, are, are profit making, and then you look at uh, the location and perspective, and uh, and then you see of how many of them are actually for sale. So it's really on a case by case basis. Uh, as far as uh, Belarus is concerned, um, as it happened, uh, together with a company um, Biotest that we acquired in Belarus a couple of years ago, we also acquired four pharmacies and. Uh, so we already have Belarusian pharmacies. That's by far not the key element of that business. It's, it's really more like a side asset. Um, but the, the, uh, the intention is to explore uh, that Belarusian uh, pharmacy uh, presence further and, and uh, decide whether or not it makes any sense to expand that uh, Belarusian pharmacy business once we already have it you know, by inheritance, if you like. Um, you know, maybe in some situations sell it. So it's it's really the matter of uh, exploration. Uh, what is this asset all about, and, and what what are the perspectives? Eva. Thank you. Why it is difficult to expand Donosela's sales in Europe without acquiring a similar company? Is there anything you would like to fo follow up on this, Salvi? Um, no, like like I said, uh, this is a matter of certification. Uh, in, in, uh, let's put it that way, in, in, in some uh, European countries, the country certificate is issued by the Union of Producers. And so the Union of Producers basically decides, do they want to issue that certificate to someone else or they do not want to issue the certificate to someone else, who eventually will become the competitor. So uh, guess what they most cases, uh, what it is they most cases decide? Um, so uh, I mean, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of formalities, and it's not a matter of uh, whether your your product meets some quality criteria or doesn't. Uh, so this has been explored, and Tono Celest has been around for more than twenty years. And even before we acquired them, they've been trying to uh, get into those markets on more serious scale in different ways, and uh, uh, and had not been succeeded. So uh, I'd say quite the research has been has been done about that uh, even before we acquired them. So, um, of course, theoretically there might, but but number of efforts in practice show that this is virtually impossible. Eva? Thank you. Is it possible that other hares manage to take control over Olma Farm and change its management, thereby shifting the balance at Ulan Farm EGMs? Well, this is really more a question to the lawyers representing the hares, but uh, from the articles of Olma Farm, um, I know that it takes 75% of share capital of Olma Farm 
to change the CEO or change articles. Um, so I believe from that perspective, and again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer of either side, uh, and um, uh, of course the, the lawyers could be, provide more competent answers if like. But according to articles, it takes 75% of share capital in Alma Farm to replace uh, CEO or to change articles. And if, if uh, those shares are split into two parts, then each each one of them uh, controls uh, you know, 33 and a third. So it's either all three of them agreeing uh, or nothing happens. Uh, but again, this is this is my understanding from the sources that are pretty much publicly available. Uh, like I said, the lawyers, of course, could come up with more detailed answer to that. Eva? Thank you. Are you certain that proposals of decisions by other hairs can be avoided at the upcoming EGM? Well, that's um, that's what we have a voting for. Um, if uh, if majority declines the proposal, then obviously it's it's uh, it's not going through. Uh, so um, the, the the current power split uh, uh, makes me think that might not go through but you know we've seen surprises but you know i do hope for some stability for this company finally uh that um that that, that we do have a stable growth oriented uh, team capable of, of working and like i said from from purely the company's management point of view such changes to amendments would absolutely not help to run the company in, in fast and efficient way Eva? do you see further declines in sales in russia how would you describe your current relationship with the Russian partners? Well, we are, we are, we are trying to work with them very closely. Um, uh, Russia is always uh, uh, somewhat of, of a guess or a gamble, if you like, uh, especially since the since, uh, volatility of ruble um, reappears uh, recently. So very many things really depend on that. Um, as, as, as long as uh, regulatory things are concerned, we are uh, pretty much, uh, in terms of all farm, we are, we are following the developments there and uh, keeping our products and their files up to date and, uh, and everything. But the big unknown always is, uh, when you talk to Russia, is, is really the, the, the ruble uh, situation and therefore the purchasing power of population, which... Uh, we have thousands of analysts covering that, but at the end of the day, it's pretty much anybody's guess anyway. So, uh, of course, we maintain the presence. We expand the the presence of our sale, of our sales reps, and uh, uh, let's say uh, doing everything that with constant ruble situation, our sales would be growing. But but then again, the the things like purchasing power of population uh, uh, do do uh, introduce the corrections to our plans. Eva? At this point, our last question. EBITDA margin has decreased during the last five years from 28% to 14 Could you expand on this issue and what EBITDA margin you see as sustainable for this business? Yeah, that, that's been quite a challenge. I mean, um, if, if you look historically, uh, EBITDA margin uh, started to drop uh, when we started to acquire uh, pharmacies, or let's say when the pharmacies started to have more and more influence on our uh, in our business, uh, but at that time the nominal nominal EBITDA wasn't falling yet. Uh, it's um, uh, so the, the first first level of falling was when when the the, the pharmacies uh, gained the bigger bigger share in the group. Uh, then I believe that was 2016 when throughout the year we made provisions of four millions for Ukrainian receivables and and those uh, reduced our EBITDA for one million euros every quarter uh, and and uh, when that effect was nearing end we uh, expanded uh, significantly our marketing efforts in several Central Asian countries and also launched um, launched uh, tonuses and, and silver analysis marketing in, in, in several other countries. Um, now it seems to be 14% is, is, is uh, I believe, quite an extreme. Um, 
uh, I believe in generally the EBITDA margin was stabilizing somewhere in the area of 15 and 16 percent. And you can see that any chart that for about one year it was was in that area. Um, so um, let's say yeah, it stabilized at 15, 16 percent uh, as our sales volumes uh, increase, which I hope we do as as uh, marketing. You see in, in some smaller countries we also start demonstrating quite some growth. I will see a bit the margin um, coming back to a bit higher levels, but uh, for next three to five years, um, I, I, I think uh, we would, should not be expecting a bit the margin much higher than something like 80, 90 percent. Uh, once those provision effects go away and and and, and, and some other issues go away, the the, the uh, 12, 12 months period. So that that would be for the medium medium term uh, medium term the, the the sustainable level. However, I would really invite to look more at uh, not at EBITDA margin but more at nominal EBITDA. Uh, for me, that would be uh, probably more important criteria uh, than uh, than the margin because uh, you know since we are involved in different segments of of the business, uh, let's say in that case if. If I have tremendous success in pharmacy business and it's increased the sales three times, it would actually mean our EBITDA margin falling even further. But EBITDA margin is not something you paid your dividend from; it's it's actual profit. So you look at the nominal numbers. But I, I believe I believe it's um, it's uh, 17, 18 percent that could be sustainable for the company. Yeah. Thank you for your insights. All questions are answered. I think we are ready to wrap up this session. As always, the recording of the webinar will be available in the NASDAQ Baltic YouTube channel and also in company's announcements. Salvi, I would like to thank you for spending the last hour with us and participants, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you very much for, jo uh, for joining. I, I really try to do my best to answer all the questions. Uh, and uh, like I said in several questions, I probably was not the best person to answer them. But uh, at least, uh, at least we have the contact up and running, uh, which is also important. And uh, like I said, we are expecting uh, planning the, the the roadshow. So if you are interested, uh, please let us know. Uh, uh, and yeah, um, nice to be back, and nice to talk to you, and uh, nice to be in touch with you. Uh, and, and thank you, Eva, too. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.